Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about pulmonary assessment and the things I want you to be thinking about are structure and function of the lungs, um, how to do a pulmonary history, review of systems, the examination or physical exam, and recording your findings. And we'll talk about a few tips to um, make your pulmonary assessment go more smoothly. Let's begin by talking about the structures and landmarks of the pulmonary system. The trachea bifurcates into its main stem bronchi at the levels of the sternal angle anteriorly and the T4 spinous process posteriorly. The trachea leads to the right and left pr primary bronchi which divide repeatedly into smaller and smaller bronchi ending in terminal bronchioles. The airway is lined with mucosal epithelium called the mucus blanket which traps pathogens and microscopic particulate matter. Hair-like projections on the epithelial cells called cilia push foreign particles up towards the larynx where the secretions are swallowed or expectorated. And then a cough is triggered by irritants of the larynx, trachea, or bronchi. The thoracic cage is a bony structure with a conical shape which is narrower at the top. It is defined by the sternum, 12 pairs of ribs, and 12 thoracic vertebrae. Its floor is the diaphragm, which is a muscular tendon and septum that separates the, the thoracic cavity from the abdomen. The first seven ribs attach directly to the sternum via their costal cartilages. Ribs 8, 9, and 10 attach to the costal cartilage, and ribs 11 and 12 are floating with free palpable tips. Okay, when looking at anterior vertical landmarks, we have the suprasternal notch, the sternal angle, also called angle of Louis, or the manubrial angle, the ribs, the intercostal spaces, and the costal angle. Um, on the next slide, we'll talk about the sternal angle. But for now, just note that each intercostal space is numbered by the rib above it, and count down the ribs in the middle of the hemithorax because costal cartilages are too close together to count near the sternum. You can palpate, palpate easily down to the tenth rib. The right and left costal margins meet at the xiphoid process and form an angle called the costal angle. Don't confuse this with the costovertebral angle in the back. The costal angle is usually 90 degrees or less. This angle increases when the rib cage is chronically overinflated as an emphysema and is often referred to as a flattened costal angle. You will typically note an increased AP to transverse ratio, also called a barrel chest. The breastbone has three parts, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. The angle of Louis is where the manubrium and the body of the sternum connect. It is continuous with the second rib. It marks the site of the tracheal bifurcation into the right and left main bronchi. It corresponds with the upper border of the atria of the heart, and it lies above the fourth thoracic vertebrae on the back. To identify the angle of Louis, start at the suprasternal notch and slide your finger over the manubrium. The connection of the manubrium and body of the sternum is continuous with the second rib, which is called the angle of Louis, also called the sternal angle or the manubrial sternal angle. You can then slide your finger over the rib and it will land right in the second intercostal space. Okay, the posterior vertical landmarks are the vertebra prominence, the spinous processes, the inferior border of the scapula, and the costovertebral angle. The vertebra prominence, C7, is the most prominent spinous process. It's the knobby bone that protrudes from the base of your neck when looking down. If there are two bony prominences, they are C7 and T1. C7 marks the apex of lung tissue. T1 is consistent with the second rib. The inferior border of the scapula is equal to the seventh rib, and the costovertebral angle is at the twelfth rib. The 
The costovertebral angle is the angle formed on either side of the spinal column between the last rib, which is the twelfth rib, and the lumbar vertebrae. Use the heel of your closed fist to strike the patient firmly over the costovertebral angles. Paint at this site will indicate perirenal inflammation. Do not do this if this patient is known to have pyelonephritis or kidney stone as you'll elicit a very painful response which will reverberate for many hours. When talking about the chest or thorax, we need to know landmarks. So please note the midsternal line, the vertebral line, the midclavicular line, the anterior and posterior axillary lines, and the mid-axillary line. Each lung is divided roughly in half by an oblique or major fissure. The right lung is further divided by a, the horizontal or minor fissure. These fissures divide the lungs into lobes. The right lobe is divided into upper, middle, and lower lobes. The left lung is divided into upper and lower lobes. The apex of the lungs lie 2 to 4 centimeters above the inner one-third of the clavicle. The anterior lower border of the lungs lie at the sixth rib at the midclavicular line and the posterior lower border lies at the spinous process of T10. With inspiration, the lungs move down another 4 to 6 centimeters at approximately T12. The pleural cavity is a body cavity that surrounds the lungs. There are two pleural cavities and they do not connect anatomically, which is why when a patient has a simple pneumothorax, the other lung can still function normally. The pleura are serous membranes that cover the outer surface of each lung called the visceral pleura, and also the inner rib cage and upper surface of the diaphragm called the parietal pleura. The parietal pleura is attached to the wall of the thoracic cavity and is innervated by the intercostal nerves and phrenic nerve, so it is highly sensitive to pain, unlike the visceral pleura, which lacks sensory innervation. The potential space between the two pleura is called the pleural space. It contains only a few milliliters of fluid which allow the two pleura to slide against each other without opposition. And the fluid also creates a surface tension which allows the lungs to expand during inspiration leading to optimal inflation of the alveoli. As you already know, breathing is largely automatic, controlled by the brainstem, and mediated by muscles of inspiration. The health history typically begins with a history of present illness. So you'll be asking all of the questions, the eight critical characteristics, or old carts. Um, but specifically ask questions about common concerning symptoms such as chest pain, dyspnea, shortness of breath or breath breathlessness, wheezing, cough, or hemoptysis. See your Tierney book, Chapter 24, for the interview framework and alarm symptoms that will help you to differentiate between cardiac and non-cardiac chest pain. Dyspnea is a non-painful but uncomfortable awareness of breathing that's inappropriate to the level of exertion. So begin your assessment with a broad question such as, have you had any difficulty breathing? Determine the severity of dyspnea based on the patient's daily activities. Any condition that increases the work of breathing or increases respiratory drive may result in dyspnea. Ask about the duration of symptoms a detailed description of the patient's dyspnea and associated signs and symptoms. Also identify risk factors from the past medical history, social, and family histories. Ask about wheezing and be very thorough. Is it worse at night or in the early morning? What does the wheezing sound like? Does it make breathing difficult? What seems to cause it? Did you have an episode of choking? An insect bite? Um, do you have a history of asthma or allergies? 
What medications do you take? Do you use a bronchodilator? Have you been around tobacco smoke? Do you smoke? Have you recently been sick? When did the wheezing begin? How long does it last? When and how often does it occur? Does it occur with eating certain foods, taking certain medications? Do any of the following things make it worse, such as being around pollens, insect, dust or chemicals, perfumes, cosmetics, being in cold air, exercise, sickness, stress? Does it go away without treatment? What helps relieve it? Rest or medications? Do you have any other symptoms such as bluish color to your lips or nails? Have you been coughing? Have you had a fever? Have you ever lost consciousness? Do you, have you lost your voice or is it hoarse? Um, do you feel panicked or confused when you're wheezing? Um, do you notice puffy red eyes or a stuffy nose? Have you ever had swelling of the lips or tongue? Cough is typically a reflex response to stimuli that irritate receptors in the larynx, tra trachea, or large bronchi. It may sometimes be cardiovascular in origin. Aside from lung conditions, chest pain may arise from cardiac, vascular, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, or skin pathology. It is also commonly associated with anxiety. Lung tissue itself has no pain fibers. Pain in lung conditions usually arise from inflammation of the adjacent parietal pleura. Other surrounding structures may also irritate the parietal pleura, causing pain. Serious causes of cough are rare. After asking the open-ended history questions, like onset, duration, etc., ask about alarm symptoms. Cough with hemoptysis, cough with fever and purulent sputum, cough with wheezing or shortness of breath, cough with chest pain, cough with excessive sputum production, cough with unintentional weight loss, cough with dyspnea and lower extremity edema. Look at your tourney text at pages 195 through 198 for differentials and focus questions to narrow the differential diagnosis. Ask whether the cough is dry or produces sputum or phlegm. Is it mucoid? white, gray, and clear, or is it purulent, which would be yellow or green, or is it bloody or brown, which may indicate blood. Ask the patient to describe the volume of any sputum, for instance, a teaspoon, a tablespoon, a cup, etc., and ask about the color, the odor, and the consistency. Establish if the patient has hemoptysis versus bleeding from the upper airway or GI tract. Hemoptysis typically includes a cough, may include frothy sputum, it persists for days, there may be a history of lung disease, and asphyxia is possible. GI usually does not involve a cough, it may present with nausea, vomiting, sputum is not blood tinged, and there may be a history of gastric or liver disease may have symptoms related to significant blood loss, such as orthostatic dizziness. With health risk factors, looking at age, we see a chest wall may be more rigid and less elastic, decreased amount of exchanged air, decreased cough reflex and cilia action, drier, more fragile mucous membranes, and if they have osteoporosis, there may be compromised lung expansion due to vertebral flattening and decreased thoracic space. Also, possibly decreased efficiency of the immune system as a person gets older. Um, in environment, we look at altitude, heat, cold, and air pollution. For example, you may have a patient in the Bay Area that likes to go to Lake Tahoe but finds they're unable to breathe up in that altitude or a person that can't tolerate cold weather or hot weather. Um, lifestyle physical activity increases rate and depth of respiration, increasing oxygen to the body. Sedentary people lack alveolar expansion and are less able to respond to respiratory stressors. In health status, think about um, GERD because of the increased risk of aspiration leading to bronchospasm and inflammation. Many diseases affect the oxygenation of blood. Medications may decrease the rate and depth of respiration. 
and with stress, hyperventilation leads to lightheadedness, numbness, tingling of fingers and toes. And the adaptive mechanism of epinephrine dilates bronchioles to increase oxygenation. Another major lifestyle risk factor is smoking. Smoking reduces the median survival of smokers by 10 years, and for each additional year of smoking past the age of 40, it reduces life expectancy by three months. By quitting cigarette smoking, a patient reduces the risk of lung cancer by 20 to 90 percent and improves survival even among those who quit after the age of 50. Although 70 percent of smokers would like to quit, and 40% make at least one quit attempt per year. Only 3 to 4% of smokers per year are successful in quitting long term. The highest risk of relapse is within the first eight days. Of note, smoking prevalence is higher in patients with a history of substance abuse and mental illness. In fact, the rate in people with schizophrenia is as high as 90%. When checking the health history and smoking history, you need to look at the number of pack years. This is the number of cigarettes smoked per day times the number of years smoked divided by 20. One pack has 20 cigarettes. For example, a patient who has smoked 15 cigarettes a day for 40 years has a 30 pack year hit smoking history. A pack year is smoking 20 cigarettes a day for one year. If someone has smoked 10 cigarettes a day for six years, they would have a three pack history. Someone who has smoked 40 cigarettes daily for 20 years has a 40 pack history. The pack year history gives us an indication of risk. Ask all patients about smoking status and assess smokers' readiness to quit. Smoking status should be documented in the medical record. Advise all smokers to seriously consider making a quit attempt using a clear and personalized message. Studies indicate that ad advice as brief as three minutes is effective. Assess all smokers' willingness to make a quit attempt. If not yet ready, offer motivational intervention using the five R's relevance, risks, rewards, roadblocks, and repetition. Assist those ready to make a quit attempt. Set a quit date. Quit date abstinence is a strong predictor of long-term success. Give advice on quitting and provide supplementary materials. Prescribe pharmacologic therapy as appropriate. Nicotine replacement therapies, bupropion hydrochloride, and ver varenicline have been proven effective. Arrange follow-up either with phone calls or office visit. Prevent relapse by congratulating its success and reinforcing reasons for quitting. Assess any difficulties with pharmacologic therapy. A simple question that can guide dosing of nicotine gum and lozenge and can indicate which patients will have more problems quitting is how much time to your first cigarette after waking? Is it greater or less than 30 minutes? The past medical history includes questions about um, past illness such as COPD, asthma, and pneumonia, recurrent upper respiratory infection, histories of malignancy or other pulmonary diseases, GERD, coronary artery disease, and um, chronic heart failure. The family history, in, you need to ask questions about malignancies and other pulmonary diseases as well as other chronic diseases. And within the social history, don't forget to ask about occupation, occupational exposures, um, any travel, especially out of the country, and if the person has pets. Included in past medical history are questions about medications. Specifically with pulmonary, don't forget to ask about rescue inhalers versus daily medications. Also, um, ask about drug allergies, herbal treatments, alternative therapies, and um, whether the patient has had immunizations, such as the flu vaccine and the Pneumovac. 
The World Health Organization estimates that 2 billion people worldwide have latent TB, while around 3 million people worldwide die of TB each year. The TB skin test, or PPD test, is used to determine if someone has developed an immune response to the bacterium that causes TB. This response can occur if someone currently has TB, if they were exposed to it in the past, or if they received the BCG vaccine. The BCG is a vaccination against TB and is recommended by the World Health Organization for all children born in countries highly endemic for TB. The U.S. has never used mass immunization of BCG. Instead, we rely on detection and treatment of latent TB. An incubation period of 2 to 12 weeks is usually necessary after exposure to the TB bacteria in order for the PPD test to be positive. The basis of reading the skin test is the presence or absence of induration. Induration is a hard, dense raised formation. Sometimes the site has erythema and or swelling. Whatever induration is present at 48 to 72 hours should be measured and recorded. Only the induration is measured, not the erythema. The diameter of the induration is measured across the forearm from the thumb side of the arm to the little finger side of the arm in the direction of a watch band. For healthy people, a TB test reading in which an induration is greater than or equal to 15 millimeters is considered positive. The test will also count as positive if blisters are present. The measurements for a positive skin test for certain people, for example, in diabetics and people with kidney disease, a TB test reading of only 10 millimeters of induration is considered positive. 5 millimeters is considered positive in, for patients who are immune compromised. Induration of less than 2 millimeters without blistering is considered a negative skin test. Although long-lasting immunity has been shown to occur after contracting the flu, it's not been shown to occur after vaccination. Therefore, the CDC recommends that people are vaccinated yearly um, to achieve optimal protection. There are two types of influenza vaccine, inactivated and live attenuated. The inactivated is killed vaccine, which is given as a flu shot, and the alive attenuated is given through nasal spray. Most people achieve protection from the flu approximately two weeks after receiving the vaccine. Pneumococcal disease is an infection caused by a type of bacteria called Streptococcus pneumonia, or pneumococcus. There are different types of pneumococcal disease, such as pneumococcal pneumonia, bacteremia, meningitis, and otitis media. The vaccinations cover approximately 8 out of the 200 strains, but have been shown to drop um, the amount of disease significantly. There are currently two types of pneumococcal vaccines, conjugated and polysaccharide. The pneumococcal conjugated vaccine, or PCV13, or Prevnar 13, is currently recommended for all children under the age of 5. It's routinely given to infants as a series of four doses. Pneumovac, a 23-valiant polysaccharide vaccine, or PPVSV, is currently recommended for use in all adults older than 65 and for people who are two weeks and older or at high risk for disease. Excuse me correction, two years or older and at high risk for disease, such as sickle cell disease, HIV infection, or other immune compromising conditions. It's also recommended for adults 19 through 64 years of age who smoke cigarettes or who have asthma. Residents of nursing homes or long-term care facilities should also get this vaccine. It's only given one time unless the vaccine was given prior to the age of 65 and then a person should be revaccinated after the age of 65. For all vaccines, you must give the patient a vaccination information statement um, by law. And so they must receive that prior to the vaccination. For preparation, you'll need good lighting, your stethoscope, alcohol swabs to clean your stethoscope, um, a small measuring tool, and if possible, the patient should be placed in a gown if you're doing a full assessment instead of just lifting up the shirt. 
so observe your patient's breathing, measure their respiratory rate, get the O2 sat, um, also note their posture if they've assumed a tripod position for example, and um, if you have the equipment check the FEV. FEV is forced expiratory volume. The forced expiratory volume over one second is the volume of air that can forcibly be blown out in one second after a full inspiration. This assesses the integrated mechanical function of the lung, chest wall, and respiratory muscles. Airway obstruction is the most common cause of reduction in FEV1 and may be secondary to bronchospasm, airway inflammation, loss of lung elastic recoil, increased secretions in the airway, or any combination of these causes. Often we check the FEV before and after giving an inhaled bronchodilator to assess the reversibility of airway obstruction. As with all physical exam, it begins with your history taking. Um, wh while observing your patient, you've done a lot of this with your general survey but you're comparing one side of the thorax and the lungs to the other so the patient serves as his or her own control. With your general survey, you're observing their general health condition, their demeanor, any mental changes, um, looking at their energy level, do they look exhausted, worn out from trying to breathe, what is their general color, and what is the color of their mucous membranes. Is their speech articulate or are they gasping and having difficulty speaking? Um, what is their respiratory rate at rest and does it increase significantly with any movement or change in position? Observe the rate, rhythm, depth, and effort of breathing. If the rhythm is regular, count the number of respirations in 30 seconds and multiply by 2. If the rhythm is irregular or less than 12 or greater than 20, you should count for one full minute. Assess for any signs of increased respiratory effort, mouth breathing, accessory muscle use, nasal flaring, um, or an O2 sat less than 90%. Um, watch for dyspnea with or without exertion and orthopnea. From a midline position behind your patient, look at the size and shape and symmetry of the chest and the way in which it moves. In the normal adult, you'll find that the transverse diameter is wider than the anterior-posterior diameter of the chest. It's typically a 2 to 1 ratio. Abnormalities in chest configuration include barrel chest, pectus excavatum, and pectus carinatum. Pectus excavatum is sometimes referred to as cobbler's chest, sunken chest, or funnel chest. It's the most common congenital deformity of the anterior wall of the chest and it can either be present at birth or not develop until puberty. Approximately 37% of individuals with pectus excavatum have a first degree relative with this condition. It's also common with Marfan syndrome and 1% of people with celiac disease present with this. The heart can be displaced and or rotated and mitral valve prolapse may also be present and base lung capacity is decreased. In pectus carinatum, also referred to as pigeon chest, is the condition causing the sternum to protrude with a narrow depression along the sides of the chest. This gives the chest a bowed out appearance similar to that of a pigeon. It may be a single abnormality or an association with other genetic disorders. Symptomatic patients report dyspnea and decreased endurance. Some develop rigidity of the chest wall with decreased lung compliance, progressive emphysema, and increased frequency of respiratory tract infections. The healthcare provider will perform a physical exam and ask questions about the patient's medical history and symptoms. Questions you should include are, when did you first notice this? Was it present at birth or did it develop as you grew? Is it getting better, worse, or staying the same? And what other symptoms are present? Kyphosis and scoliosis are alterations in spinal alignment that impact chest configuration. Older adults may have decreased chest expansion. You may also see barrel chesting with COPD, kyphosis due to bone degeneration, and scoliosis. 
Also include assessment of fingernails. Um, look back at your dermatology lecture, section two. Um, but look at color for any discoloration. Um, shape changes, do the profile sign to check for clubbing, and check for ridges. Using the palms of your hands, lightly palpate for tenderness, alignment, bulging, and retractions of the chest and the intercostal spaces. Palpate the anterior and posterior portions of the thorax. Test chest expansion by placing your thumbs at the level of the tenth rib with your fingers loosely grasping and parallel to the, the lateral rib cage. Watch the distance between the thumbs as they move apart during inspiration. They should they should move up and apart with each deep breath. A patient with consolidation, such as pneumonia or tumors, or with a pneumothorax, you'll see a decreased expansion on the affected side. Other causes of abnormal chest excursions include splinting, bronchial obstruction, pleural effusion, or lobar pneumonia. Vocal fremitus refers to the vibrations created by the vocal cords during phonation. These vibrations are transmitted down the tracheobronchial tree and through the alveoli to the chest wall. When these vibrations are felt on the chest wall, they're called tactile fremitus. You'll have tactile fremitus increased with consolidation and decreased with pleural effusion. Ask your patient to say 99 several times in a normal voice. 99, 99, 99, etc. Palpate using the ball of your hand. You should feel the vibrations transmitted through the airways to the lung. Um, increased tactile firmitus again suggests consolidation of the underlying lung tissue such as with lobar pneumonia. Absent or decreased tactile firmitus will be found with bronchial obstruction, COPD, pneumothorax, tumor, and pleural effusion. I think this picture is a great visual demonstration of consolidation, also known as infiltrate or inflammation, versus effusion, which is fluid surrounding the lung. With infiltration, you'll feel an increased fremitus, versus with effusion, you'll feel absent or decreased fremitus. An effusion is fluid built up between the layers of the pleura, and um, once accumulating more than 300 milliliters of fluid, you'll note other clinical signs, such as decreased chest expansion on the affected side, dull percussion over the fluid, diminished breath sounds, decreased vocal resonance, which refers to bronchos bronchophony, egophony, and whispered pectoriloquy, decreased fremitus, and possibly a pleural friction rub. When performing percussion, perform from side to side to assess for symmetry. Percussion helps establish whether the underlying tissues, we're talking five to seven centimeters deep, are air-filled, fluid-filled, or solid. Percussion notes can be flat, as over muscle, dull, as over organs, resonant, which is typical over the lungs, hyperresonant, as with air trapping in emphysema, or tympanic as over the abdomen over gas bubbles. For the technique, place your middle finger of your non-dominant hand over the back or chest. Don't make contact on the patient's skin with other fingers or the palm of your hand because this will diminish the vibrations that you're trying to create. Strike briskly with the index or middle finger of your dominant hand. When percussing the chest, you need to perform it side to side to assess for asymmetry. Percussion helps establish whether the underlying tissue at five to seven centimeters deep are air-filled, fluid-filled, or solid. Percussion notes would be flat or dull if you have increased fluid or soft tissue within the chest cavity, consolidation, pleural effusion, or bronchial obstruction. Resonance is normal um, when percussed over the lungs um, due to the presence of air. Hyperresonance will be heard with air trapping as with emphysema. And um, tympany might be heard if the chest contains free air, um, such as pneumothorax, or if the abdomen is distended with gas. Um, 
techniques, place your middle finger of your non-dominant hand over the back or chest, but don't make contact with a patient's skin with your other fingers or palm because they'll diminish the vibrations that you're trying to create. Characteristics of the different sounds are with flat, you'll hear short, soft, high-pitched, or dull sound heard over bone or muscle, indicating consolidation when heard over the chest. Dull is a thud-like sound heard over solid organs such as the liver, but may indicate fluid in the lung, as with pneumonia. Resonant is a long, low-pitched, slightly hollow sound, typically heard over the lungs or abdomen, and may indicate bronchitis. Hyperresonant is very loud, lower-pitched sound, typically heard over the stomach, may indicate hyperinflated lungs, as with emphysema or pneumothorax. And timpani is loud, high-pitched, drum-like sound as heard over a puffed-out cheek. It indicates excessive air as in a large pneumothorax. When percussing the anterior chest, the heart normally produces an area of dullness to the left of the sternum from the third to the fifth rib interspaces. With the posterior chest, diaphragmatic excursion measures the movement of the diaphragm during breathing. The normal um, finding is 3 to 5 centimeters, but can be 6 to 8 centimeters in someone very well conditioned. It's performed by asking the patient to exhale and hold. The provider then percusses down the back to the intercostal margins, starting below the scapula until sounds change from resonant to dull. That's where the provider marks the first spot. Then the pr patient takes a deep breath and holds it in as the provider percusses down again, marking the spot where the sound changes from resonant to dull again. Then the provider will measure the distance between the two spots. Repeat on the other side. Um, it's usually higher on the right. If it's less than 3 to 5 centimeters, the patient may have a pneumonia or pneumothorax, so a chest x-ray would be indicated. We're going to percuss down your back for diaphragmatic excursion. What I'm going to want you to do is to take a deep breath in, let it out, and then hold it. I will do some percussion. Then I will need you to take another deep breath in and hold it, and I will percuss some more. So let's start now. Take a deep breath in, let it out, and hold it. Now take a deep breath in and hold it. And you can let it out. And as I measure that, it comes to be about five centimeters, which is an expected amount of diaphragmatic excursion. Be careful to monitor breathing throughout the examination and offer times for the person to rest as you're listening to breath sounds. Patients may try to be good patients and hyperventilate if you're not keeping a good eye on them. While standing behind the patient, um, listen to the following lung areas, posterior from the apices to C7 to the bases around T10, and laterally from the mid-axillary line down to the 7th or 8th rib. Use the um, sequence illustrated on the slide. Breath sounds are produced by turbulent airflow and are categorized by the size of the airways that transmit them to the chest wall in your stethoscope. The general rule is that the larger the airway, the louder and higher pitch the sound. Vesicular breath sounds are low pitched and normally heard over most lung fields. Tracheal breath sounds are heard over the trachea. Bronchovesicular and bronchial sounds are heard in between. Breath sounds are decreased when normal lung is displaced by air, as with emphysema or pneumothorax, or if displaced by fluid, such as pleural effusion. Breath sounds shift from vesicular to bronchial when there's fluid in the lung. Suspect pneumonia or tissue consolidation when sounds are heard when they shouldn't be. Tracheal breath sounds are very loud, harsh, sound high-pitched. Um, inspiration is equal to expiration. 
they're found over the trachea and they might be heard in other areas um, if there is a pneumonia, atelectasis, or fluid infiltration. Bronchial sounds are loud and high-pitched. There's short silence between inspiratory and expiratory sounds. Expiratory sounds last longer than inspiratory. They're heard over the manubrium and next to the trachea. If heard elsewhere, the causes consolidation such as pneumonia, atelectasis, or fluid infiltration. Bronchovesicular sounds are heard over the first and second interspaces between the scapula. They're not as loud as bronchial. They're considered medium intensity, medium pitch, and inspiratory and expiratory sounds are about equal. Detecting differences are easier in the expiratory phase. Vesicular sounds are heard over most of the lung parenchyma. They're soft and low pitched. Inspiration is greater than expiration. Extra sounds that originate in the lungs and airways are referred to as adventitious and are always abnormal, but not always significant. Note the timing in the respiratory cycle, the location on the chest wall, and if the sound persists from breath to breath. Any change after cough or change in patient's position should also be noted. Crackles are defined as coarse or fine, and those are discontinuous popping or bubbling sounds like a milkshake being sucked through a straw or wood burning and crackling in a fireplace. They occur as, forced, um, as air is forced through fluid-filled airways, causing the alveoli to open suddenly or snap open. Persistent fine crackles are scattered over the chest um, and occur with pneumonia, bronchiolitis, or atelectasis. You may hear them in the upper lung fields only as occurs with cystic fibrosis. Crackles only in the lower fields occur with heart failure. Wheezes are defined as sonorous or sibilant. They're musical sounds and occur when air moves quickly through mucus-filled, narrowed airways. They can be heard on inspiration and or expiration. Expiratory wheezing occurs with lower airway obstruction, such as asthma or bronchiolitis. When it's unilateral, it may be a foreign body aspiration. Strider is a high-pitched inspiratory crowing sound heard without the stethoscope um, caused by upper airway obstruction, croup, or acute epiglottitis. A pleural friction rub is a creaking or grating sound caused by inflamed pleural sur surfaces rubbing together. They're sometimes heard with pneumonia. Vocal sounds are bronchophony, whispered pectoriloquy, and egophony. As a vocal sound is transmitted from the larynx down through the trachea, the bronchi, the alveoli, and then to the chest wall, the sound becomes less distinct and much softer than when heard directly through the mouth. Words can be heard distinctly or very clearly when fluid builds up in the alveoli. With bronchophony, ask your patient to say 99 several times while listening to both lungs. The lung sounds that you hear should be muffled and indistinct. If the sound is loud and clear, then that would be called bronchophony and again would be a sign of fluid in the lungs or in the alveoli. Whispered pectoriloquy, patient whispers 99 or blue moon and you auscultate again and should hear only faint sounds or nothing at all. If you hear the sounds clearly, um, it's referred to as whispered pectoriloquy, and that's when um, you would again note that there's fluid in the alveoli. Egophony, ask your patient to say E continuously. The sound will change to I, or going from E to E. Um, it, this sound is called egophony, if heard and again is a sound from consolidation. There are many ways that you can document. Normal findings are a symmetrical thorax with good expansion, resonant lungs, um, vesicular breath sounds, no crackles or wheezes, and clear to auscultation bilaterally. Also no um, vocal sounds noted, such as bronchophony, egophony, or whispered pectoraliqui. 
to document abnormals, you're, you should be looking for kyphosis, increased AP mm -hmm. diameter, um, decreased expansion, hyperresonant lungs, um, distant breath sounds, delayed expiratory phase, scattered expiratory wheezes, decreased phrematis, um, bronchophony, egophony, or whispered pectoriloquy. I hope by now you've noted that the three tests are testing the same thing. They're all testing for fluid in the alveoli, so you only need to do one of those. And um, if the diaphragm is descending two centimeters centimeters bilaterally, it's not descending enough because remember that should be three to five centimeters. Typical findings with lobar pneumonia would include a midline trachea, dullness to percussion over the area of consolidation, bronchial breast sounds over the area of consolidation, increased tactile phrematis over consolidation, late inspiratory crackles, and positive egophony, whispered pectoriloquy, and bronchophony. In contrast, with emphysema, the trachea will be midline. You'll have diffuse hyperresonance on percussion. Um, breast sounds will be decreased or absent. Decreased tactile phrematis. There will be no um, vocal sounds such as bronchophony, egophony, or whispered pectoriloquy, and no adventitious sounds. So in conclusion, be intentional. Always think about where you're placing your stethoscope and why. And always think of your patient first, not the disease. You'll be a great practitioner if you follow those guidelines. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.